Week 10 has officially wrapped up. We are now in the second half of the season, and that is why we are talking about second half league winners on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Fellas podcast. Welcome in, Lucas Munson, Cameron Lawrence, hanging out with you tonight. Cameron, what do we have looking forward to on today's episode? We've got a lot of guys that you should be targeting for these trade deadlines hit, and a lot of guys who, like you said, are league winners. They're gonna they're gonna put you in a spot to take home that championship. And that's why we are talking about them now because we do recognize trade deadlines are coming up quick. Some people have theirs even before week eleven. Most people have theirs between week twelve and thirteen, right before that last bye week in week fourteen. We're going to talk about second half league winners in today's episode some strength of schedule guys some guys that hey you know what you might have might have forgotten from uh, early on in the season we're now coming back have a real chance to bring home the championship for you down the stretch we'll talk about them and so much more on today's episode but before we dive in make sure you subscribe to the podcast if you're listening to the audio podcast we are grateful for you over there make sure you subscribe and turn on those notifications so you know when all of our new weekly episodes go up and same over on youtube as well if you're watching the video format of this Heidi Ho there uh, make sure you subscribe on YouTube turn on those notifications as well because not only will you know when the podcast go up you'll know when all of our videos go up like Ty's waiver wire video that went up yesterday Cam's got a trade video coming out tomorrow I'll have starts on Friday and all of our shorts that are coming out every single day as well you'll be notified when all those videos go live and you know what, if you want to follow us on the socials for more content, because, you know, we're not just posting video content. We have stuff over like over on Twitter or mm-hmm. X. We still haven't updated that on any of our graphics here on the overlays in, in StreamYard. But FFL is over on Twitter. DFFL is on Instagram. Uh, and Fantasy Football Fellas on TikTok and Facebook as well. Let's dive on into it. We got eight league winners to talk about. I'm excited to discuss them all with you. Uh, see what's in store for these guys down the stretch, why we think they could potentially bring you home the chip, what you should do with them. If you have them on your roster, if you don't have them on your roster, uh, let's dive on in. Let's talk some league winners. So as I said, we got eight, Players we are going to cruise through. Cameron and I are just going to bounce back and forth here. We each have four guys lined up for you that we love as league winners in the second half of the season. I think we got quite a bit of overlap on ours because mm-hmm. there's a lot of guys I see that Cameron has on his list that I am very excited to talk about as well. So, Cameron, I'll let you kick things off, actually. Who's your first league winner in the second half of the season? It's a little bit of a twofer. I'm going to I'm gonna spend the mo- majority of the time on David Montgomery. I think Jameer Gibbs kind of falls into this as well. But David Montgomery is a guy we're going to spend more time talking about Um, he is in that Jamal Williams role that we talked about coming into the season, right? And he's an upgrade from Jamal Williams. Um, in every way possible. Exactly. But they, they've stuck true to exactly what they want to do. He's 12th in red zone touches right now. and He's only played six games, right? I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, he's playing three less games, four less games, more than most guys. And he is 12th in red zone touches this last week. He scored a touchdown. Um, he was also stopped on the goal line twice in the same possession. And then Jameer Gibbs took a goal line touchdown from him. I mean, he could have had another three touchdown game um, this week. And you might say, well, he got bailed out by a 74 yard touchdown, but that's exactly what makes him more special than what we saw with Jamal Williams, right? Jamal Williams did have a 50 yarder last year, but it was on a play where the entire team sold out and he just ran through an open hole and beat everyone to the house. This one, David Montgomery made guy, multiple guys miss. He won a foot race to the house, right? I mean, that's something that Jamal Williams can't do. That's something that David Montgomery brings that's extra, that even on games where, you know, he gets stuffed at the goal line two times, Jameer Gibbs takes a goal line touchdown, he can still break a break a run like that. Um, and, you know, that's something that he's kind of always had. He's going to make more, more people miss. And in this game, they eased him back in. He played only 38% of snaps, but still saw 12 carries in the game, right? Still saw over 100 yards in the touchdown. And the thing is, Jameer Gibbs has been the running back one in points per game over the last four weeks in his last three games, averaging 28 PPR fantasy points per game. Absolutely ridiculous. But that doesn't mean Monty's not going to be or can't be, you know, top 12 as well. The way that they run this offense, you know, Monty's got the guaranteed touches and touchdowns as his floor and Gibbs is the receiving work and efficiency as his floor. And there's going to be a little bit of overlap. This is going to be probably closer to 50, 50% snapshare, uh, you know, split 
as we keep moving forward. But I still think Monty maintains more touches. Um, Dan Campbell came back out before this game, doubled down on that. That's how they want to run this. They want Monty to be the main power back and Gibbs kind of be that change of pace guy. Obviously, Gibbs is getting to the point where they can't take him off the field because he looks right. absolutely amazing. But Monty, Monty showed in this game, you know, he's still good. Like, this, you know, you can Gibbs can be great and Monty can still be really good himself. So I think both are going to be league winners. But I think right now, after, you know, especially the game we just saw, I think Monty's a guy that you could really go out and get much cheaper that would, you know, will be able to propel your team um, come playoff time. Chicago, Green Bay, New Orleans, you're not excited about Chicago, Denver, Minnesota. In his next six, in his next six games, yes, mm. I like all those matchups. I, again, you're, you're a little nervous about New Orleans. Minnesota's actually been really good against the run this year, but it's also the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah, anything can happen on any given day with the Vikings. But I love those matchups coming up. Those are exploitable matchups. Again, thirty-eight percent of the snaps, seventeen point six fantasy points, is crazy. Yeah, to me. Uh, and considering, did he even get any receiving work? I don't believe he did. Zero reception, zero targets. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. purely rushing work on 38% of the snaps, and he gets you 17 and a half fantasy points. The bet, and this is this is what's glorious about the Lions' backfield is that it doesn't matter if, if it's if it's a hot hand approach. Mm-hmm. Which I like. I don't know if the intent was to keep David Montgomery down, you know, below 40% of the snaps. Have you seen anything on that? Uh, no, I haven't. I didn't see okay. anything come out about it, but I, would I just wanted to make sure I did miss the injury. Yeah, right, right. And that's my assumption is that, you know, fresh off an of injury, they're still going to keep him fresh. But I mean, 12 rushing attempts to Jameer Gibbs is 14. Like, split, obviously, Jameer Gibbs, five targets as well. But even if they play hot hand here, there's opportunity for both of them. Oh, this is what sure. we've been saying all year long is that both of these guys can be weekly top 15 options. Even if one of them has the hot hand, and Jameer Gibbs had the hot hand yesterday. Granted, again, David Montgomery over 100 yards on 12 attempts, but still, I it was, yeah, you can go on to get David Montgomery a whole heck of a lot cheaper than you can get Jameer Gibbs right now, and mm-hmm. I would be willing to do that. For sure. Who would you rather have for us this season, Monty or Jameer Gibbs? I think I'd t- the way. I think I'd take Jameer Gibbs. Jameer Gibbs is a guy that, you know, I've, I was high on coming into the year, and I... I really like, you know, his upside still. And if it's closer to 50 for 50 split, I think just efficiency wise, receiving wise, he's going to be higher. But at the same time, like consistency, you know, if you're looking for a guy who's going to be consistent, I mean, Monty's probably as good as you're going to get as a running back too. A hundred percent. I agree with that. Most definitely. You're not getting the the same amount of upside as you would with Jameer Gibbs, but I, you, you might get more consistency. Yes. Uh, depending on the week. So I'm with you there. David Montgomery, I think is an excellent league winner coming down. The stretch. I'm going to talk about another running back here. I want to talk about Jerome Ford, running back for the mm-hmm. Cleveland Browns. He is the guy. Do not get it twisted. When Nick Chubb went down, the team brings in Kareem Hunt. He is not a threat. I know Kareem Hunt scored a touchdown last week. I know there's a threat to, to be a nuisance there, but this dude is playing through a high ankle sprain. <laughs> this dude suffered a high ankle sprain two weeks ago, and he has now played through it in two consecutive weeks. I don't know why he's doing it. Yeah, clue. I, I don't even know it's a high ankle sprain. That might just be a myth. There's a lot of weird injury <laughs> things going on in Cleveland <laughs> this year. Yep. He roped into Sean Lawson too, but 17 for 107, 6.3 yards per carry against Baltimore last week. And they're a stingy run. They defense. are like Baltimore is not an easy team, especially in a divisional matchup. That is not an easy team to run on. And the man just does not go down this year. Dude's a big play waiting to happen. He is ninth in yards after contact this year. He is sixth in breakaway run rate, which is is runs of 15 plus yards. A percent amount of his runs that go for 15 plus yards. 38%. I believe it was 38%. I'm pulling that number out of my head. I know it's sixth for sure, but you look at the schedule rest of the season. Sorry, I'm like, I like closed my tab no, on good. PFF that I wanted to keep up. I'm like, oh wait, shoot, it's not here. And I'm pretty sure it was 38 and a half. Anyways, uh, you look at his rest of schedule rest of the season. Fifth easiest. Uh, he gets Pittsburgh, Denver, Jacksonville, who I know had a nice week against San Francisco's run defense, but let's be honest. Um, I, I they've been they've been able to be run on all year. Chicago, Houston, and the Jets in six of their final seven games if this team is going to feed him the football continue to give him majority of the snaps there is a real chance i think that jerome ford gives you more top 15 weeks than not the rest of the season 
I'm even willing to go as far as saying Jerome Ford has a chance to give you more top 12 weeks than not the rest of the season. I just love the schedule. I love the offense that he's in. I don't think Kareem Hunt is as big of a threat as we think. If he keeps taking the touchdown, sure, we can revisit that. But some of those are going to start falling back to Jerome Ford's way as he starts to get healthier. He's the guy in Cleveland. The schedule is great coming up. And a lot of people are going to look at me and call me an idiot for thinking, holy crap, Cleveland's backup can be a league winner. But even, even before his injury, when Nick Chubb went out, dude was a top 12 running back in PPR formats. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's a real chance he finishes top 12 in that top 10 range the rest of the season. For sure. And I mean, Kareem Hunt's going to be annoying in the same way he was for Nick Chubb, right? He is yeah, he yeah. is clearly the backup when Jerome Ford's on the field. He'll see. I mean, he's going to score touchdowns. So I mean, Kareem Hunt just, out of all the running backs in the NFL right now, he's one of the best at finding the end zone. He just does, yeah. um, which is going to be annoying, right? Because you're going to look at the box score and Kareem Hunt's going to be only, you know, five or six fantasy points behind Jerome Ford. And he's going to have, you know, a quarter of the touches. It's just yep. he's going to find the end zone. But that doesn't mean Ford can't as well. This is a a team that's going to be still built on running the ball, even with Deshaun, you know, even with Watson playing decent in this last game. It's not like Deshaun Watson's at a point where they're going to, he's going to carry him to the playoffs. Um, So they're going to keep relying on him. And yeah, he's the dude. He's not Nick Chubb, but he's in this Nick Chubb-esque role where I think he can continue to perform. If he's going to be a tough runner, if he's going to continue to break off big runs, big gains, big chunk plays, yeah, I'm all in on under room four. That's the kind of running back I want on my fantasy football team. And like he can get involved in the passing attack. Mm-hmm. I know he wasn't this last week, but even the week prior, seven targets, five receptions. Like there is sneaky PPR upside there for Jerome Ford as well. Uh, sure. Depends on the game plan for the given week. He might, he might give you a nice boost there, but yeah, Jerome Ford. I love him rest of season. Cameron, I'll kick it back to you now for your second league winner. We're going to change up positions here. Uh, let's discuss the guy down in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, Marquise Brown. Um, he's a guy we were in on at the beginning of the year just because of how low his ADP was. We knew Kyler was going to come back, and Marquise Brown actually surprised throughout this season so far. I think. I mean, he's a wide receiver, twenty six, so not fantastic. Um, he's kind of cooled off the last couple weeks, but um, he was top twenty wide receiver there for a couple. Or, you know, I think the first seven weeks or so, and top that's not the first four for sure. And that's not something you were expecting, you know, coming into the year with we didn't know if it's Clayton Toon or um Colt McCoy ended up being Josh Dobbs. You weren't you weren't ready for that, but he's played very well. Um he's top 15 so far this year in um targets, but he's only got a 53% catch rate. Uh, he's third in unrealized air yards, which just means the ball's going to him a lot and he going downfield a lot is they're just not connecting, which is going to happen when you got like Josh Dobbs out there being thrown into an offense, right? This isn't the Minnesota Vikings offense where he's got weapons everywhere, where he's got a, you know, a coach who's all about, you know, getting guys in open space, right? I think Arizona's starting to get that better than they were with Cliff Kingsbury, mm-hmm. but you know, it's, it is a different system with different types of weapons. He's 15th and deep targets and he's top 10 at red zone targets. He's also fourth in dominator rating, which just means, air yards targets that it calculates all that in um and he just has the highest percentage of that i don't remember what the exact um calculation is for that but i do know that it has yeah. to do with air yards and targets yeah. um and then we look at last year with kyler uh, obviously um this last week was disappointing one for four one one reception on four targets 28 yards he did have a touchdown just right off of his fingertips that kyler missed like a 30 40 yard touchdown Kyler missed Miami, no. So it could have been a much better day, but still disappointing. But we look at last year before D Hop got here, weeks one through six. We talk about this all offseason. This I think this was one of our favorite stats to continually bring up. He was a wide receiver five in those first six weeks. 43 receptions on 64 targets, 485 yards and three touchdowns, 18.1 fantasy points per game. All right. I mean, that's an that's something we're gonna see again. Zach Ertz was super productive during that time. So even if you know Trey McBride keeps playing really well. That's how this offense ran last year. James Conner even was playing well um, during that time. And I think we got to remember, too, this was Kyler's first game since first action at all since week 14 last year. Right. I mean, he had no preseason, no training camp. He's, you know, just getting in practice where nobody's allowed to, you know, even rush him hard because they don't want him in his area. So this is his first real action. So, yeah, it's going to look different probably these first two weeks which is fine. I mean, he gets Houston and Los Angeles Rams these next two weeks, who is actually, who've actually been pretty stingy, 
you know, second yeah. decently stingy secondaries, right? They're not like right. top five, top seven, but yeah, right. they've been good. And then he gets Pittsburgh, who's hasn't been great, and they have the bye, and then they have San Francisco, Chicago, Philly. All three teams you can throw on, especially in San Francisco and Philly games, they're going to have to throw the ball if they want to be competitive at all. Like those are two offenses that could get up on them pretty quick. Uh, Arizona did play San Francisco well um, to start the season. And I think this offense is going to continue to just get better with Kyler there. So you're getting better. You know you have a connection that's been established in the past. Um, and then like you just believe like Marquise Brown has always been this type of guy where he could you can always see the path to being a high end wide receiver too. And it's just never fully clicked. It looks like, you know, I mean, he's in one of the best spots to finally do it the second half of the season. Yeah. And going back to that dominator rating, essentially it's just the, the total of the team's receiving production. There you uh, go. And that has been Hollywood. I mean, yeah, yep. you're right. That does take into account target share, air yard share receiving. It, it takes into mm-hmm. account all of that, but yeah, he like in terms of the team's total, receiving production marquise brown is fourth in that relative metric across all wide receivers yeah i mean again you, you look at that schedule coming up yeah the, you mentioned pittsburgh san francisco chicago philly seattle will close out the season i mean that's a great stretch of games for for him to you know finally crack that you know 61 receiving yard mark again he's only done that against san francisco this year and you get the upgrade at quarterback the targets have been there all year more games of eight plus targets than fewer than eight targets mm-hmm. the volume's been there the accuracy is not i mean you look four for 10 four for 11 or 11 sorry yeah. four receptions on 10 targets four receptions on 11 targets four on eight targets yeah 53 I mean, percent catch rate is what he's at right now which rivals yeah. were dj moore was last year Devonte uh, adams was last you know Devonte had 100 receptions but he had 180 targets right that's the only reason it was super productive but you think like dj moore last year and you think of being disappointed a lot that was marquise brown through the first half of the year yeah, and, and I think we're going to see that increase now the second 100%. half of the season now that you get Kyler Murray back, yeah. who I think will be a more accurate quarterback than Josh Dobbs, who is no slouch himself. I no, mean, definitely not. We are got Josh that Dobbs believer now at this point. Yeah, he is. he has got that magic in him. He does. I get to the point where I think I've brought up my supervisor multiple times. She's not a big professional uh, football fan, but she she can identify oh, I saw something about josh dobbs on facebook he must have played well yeah he played really well yes he sunday did. so no we are believers in in josh dobbs um and yeah we'll, we'll see an, uh, an uptick in marquise brown's production here with kyla murray back as the season goes on as kyla gets more comfortable back in this offense i'm going to stick at the wide receiver position for my next league winner uh i'm going to stick with another team in the afc west as well how about Debo Samuel, the San Francisco 49ers? I know I was very harsh on Debo in the first part of the season, before the season even started. I thought he would be a league loser this year. And, I mean, to, to some extent he has. And he was hot there, but then he misses a stretch of games, which you mm-hmm. you just can't have a, you know, at, at that part of the year. When you're missing the meat of the season, yeah. managers can really start to build a lead uh, over teams in their division start to really build their playoff hopes. That's just not a part of the season you can miss. But let me also say that that this that this section applies a lot to Brandon Ayuk as well. But there's a reason why I want to talk about Debo specifically over Brandon Ayuk as a league winner because I think Debo actually potentially carries more upside down the stretch than Brandon Ayuk. That may sound crazy, but hear me out. His first game back in Week 10, actually pretty fine. Four targets, caught all four for 30 yards. He did get three rush attempts, 29 yards, and a score there. Wide receiver 16 before Monday Night Football. We are recording before Monday Night Football. I forgot to mention that. Uh, but 16 fantasy points on the week. Good for the wide receiver 16 thus far. And if you look at his his rest of season schedule, like when you open Sleeper, and you know how you can see the matchups mm-hmm. on each player. Yeah, red, orange, yellow. That, red, it, orange. it is. That, that sucker is all green rest of season, <laughs> except for Baltimore week 16. But uh, still, that could be a potentially fun game. But you look at it, Tampa Bay, Seattle, Philadelphia, Seattle, Arizona, Washington in six of his final seven. It's the dark green, too. It's not even the light green. It's, it's not even the light green. green. It is the dark green. And over the last four weeks, all, all of these teams are top 12 in fantasy points per game allowed to wide receivers. Yeah. I mean, this is a wide receiver gold mine coming up here for San Francisco. And Brock Purdy, he's playing out of his mind, right? I mean, he got a little bit lucky with that, Brandon. You touched on last week. I can't give Brock Purdy too much credit. But bounce back nicely after two down games. I think he got a little too much heat for that, I'll be honest. Yeah. But playing good ball. And better yet, the thing is, you, you know, Debo Samuel can get a few rush attempts in here. 
Both mm-hmm. Seattle and Arizona have been top five in fancy points per game with all their running backs over the last four weeks. So there's opportunity not only for Debo to have success through the air, you know, if Debo could rip off a, a 25 yard touchdown run. All of a sudden, you know, you're looking at a bonus eight fantasy points you weren't going to get on top of the, you know, five receptions on seven targets for 62 yards you could probably get as well. So sure. not only is Debo going to see more snaps and utilization in future weeks, it is not going to be an insane blowout of the Jacksonville Jaguars every single week. Like you even look at the snap share, his and Ayuk snap shares were down this week. And I mean, they were just absolutely dominating the Jacksonville Jaguars. There was no mm-hmm. need to keep him out on the field the whole game, but there's going to be opportunity for him to increase uh, his snaps. There's increased upside here in the running game and favorable matchups. I like, I sneaky think Debo Samuel could win you your league down the stretch uh, and make me eat my words at the start of the year saying that he was a league loser, even though he missed such a crucial part of the fancy football season. For sure. I'm, I am, I will admit, a little more hesitant on Debo just because yeah. of, like you said, it could easily be, be IUK. There's Kittle on that offense as well. Um, and then obviously CMC is the lead. Um, but I do agree. I mean, at the end of the day, outside of CMC, who has the most upside in this offense, every single week it's going to be Debo Samuel because of what he can do on the field. Um, I do think that it is a benefit that like Elijah Mitchell, George Mason are not getting carries in the same way that they were last season, you know, when they, um, yep. or even the beginning of this year, right. They're not mixing them in. So I think that benefits Debo finding carries on the ground, right. It's going to be CMC and him mainly. Um, but like you said, it's really hard to ignore the fact that he has that amazing schedule moving forward. It's hard to ignore the fact that we know how talented he is. Yeah. Um, It'll just remain to be seen. Is it going to be consistent enough with Ayuk and Kittle also on that offense? So let me let's let's run through a few names quick because I think if you're not a fantasy manager who owns Debo Samuel currently, mm-hmm. I would I would say I, I think it's worth trying to get your hands on him for the price that you'll probably have to pay for sure. Um, would you rather have Nico Collins or Brandon or uh, or uh, Debo Samuel rest of the season? Probably uh, D- Debo Samuel for sure. Actually, I think I think I would too. And I mean, I know Nico, you know, missed last week, but I mean, I think he still carries that like sneaky upside. And you might have to pay yeah. a little bit of an extra running back in there. But for, for how many close. games Debo Samuel has missed, I think that's closer yeah. than the managers yep. would actually be willing to admit. Uh, would yeah. you rather have DeAndre Hopkins or Debo Samuel? Ooh, um, I think. Hopkins definitely gonna be more consistent, but I think I'm definitely I we, like if that's in front of me, I'm definitely clicking on Debo there. How about Chris Godwin or Debo? I, I feel like you gotta go Debo. Godwin's just been disappointing this year. He has been disappointing. I, I just threw out a, a a tweet real. I just threw out a tweet that I saw. Justin Jefferson is scoring more points on the season than Chris Godwin is right now. Godwin's played twice as many games. Right, which is just insane. Yeah, <laughs> Chris Godwin has been has been disappointing this year. He has. Last one. Last one. I'll throw out there just for speculation. Uh, how about DK Metcalf or Debo Samuel? DK Metcalf, uh, let's keep in mind, just a stupid amount of targets, 9, 14, only 4 in Week 9, but back up to 12 against Washington this week. They're starting to get him more involved, but would you rather have him or Debo Samuel down the stretch? I feel like you got to go Debo, right? Probably the b- better target, you know, same same quality of targets, but he's on a better offense that's going to score more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with Debo there. Yeah, I think I'm going to as well, but this is just to get the wheels turning, right? Yes, of, for sure. You might not be able to get a one-for-one swap on these guys. Uh, most managers who probably you know see these performances are like, ah, oh, DK sucked recently. And Debo, you know what? He was all right in his first game. You might have to throw in a little bit of a sweetener. Uh, DK, I feel like you could get Debo DK, you plus. could do a... I think you, you could, could get Debo plus, honestly, because DK's... Because I think his name just carries so much still that people are like, he's getting the targets. He's a big name. You know, I took him with a second or third overall pick. He hasn't been injured. So I do think DK, you could get Debo plus. Yeah. And second, third round pick you spent yeah. on DK Metcalf. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I there, there's a world where that might happen. Yeah. I think, I think he's the most likely you could get a straight swap for. For sure. For sure. Let's take a quick break. Uh, We'll be back with a few more league winners, but we'll take a minute to hear from our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, we love Underdog. It is the easiest place to play best ball formats, and they even have their own form of player props called Pick'em. You can make up to 20 times your money on a single night by correlating props together. 
Two picks will triple your money. Three will six times it. Four will ten times it. And five plays that all hit will multiply your entry by 20. You can even place insurance on your picks too. So if only four of your five props hit, you still get 10 times your entry. And if you use our code fellows when signing up, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100. Alrighty, we are back. We're going to wrap up talking four more league winners in the second half of the season. So far, we have covered David Montgomery, Jerome Ford, Marquise Brown, and Debo Samuel. Cameron, you're going to keep us in the wide receivers. Mm -hmm. Who's your third league winner in the second half of the season? Uh, it's my guy. It's Devonta Smith. I, yes, I'm, a, I'm a little worried that I'm just kind of trying to will this one to be, but... Um, I think the biggest reason right now, and the biggest reason for Optimus is Dallas Goddard is going to be out for at least three more games at this point, um, maybe more, right? He broke his arm. And when Dallas Goddard was out last season, Devonta saw eight plus targets in every single game, 13 plus fantasy points in all but one game. Um, and then you look at their schedule coming up to Kansas City, Buffalo, San Francisco, Dallas. Not necessarily great matchups, but these are going to be some shootouts. These are going to be some high quality, high scoring games. Yeah. Um, I know these teams got great defenses, but man, when you pat, you, you know, you're matching up Mahomes and Hurts, Allen Hurts, I mean, San Francisco and Hurts, and then Dak and Hurts. I can't give Purdy that put that Purdy's name in that group, but um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, but the 49ers offense yes. is high powered enough where Purdy can hang with the Eagles yes. and hang put points on them. 100%. Like when you would look at that, I mean, those are going to be high scoring games. And then to finish the fantasy season, you get Seattle, the Giants, Arizona. You're only worried with them. That is that they're going to put up so many points that starters can be out in the halfway through the third quarter, right? <laughs> they're going to put up points. They're going to be able to throw the ball against those teams. Um, and, you know, coming off the bye last season, right? I said eight plus targets in every game without Dallas Goddard. He had eight plus um, targets in every all but one game coming off the bye last season. Um, and I know it's been a little more disappointing this year, a little more erratic, right? He's had a couple 20 point games, and then some like he had a one point game, eight, nine. So, not exactly what you want to see. He's only had 21% target share. Um, I think he was 24% last year. So, you wanted to see that increase. We haven't, but he's still top 25 in targets, routes run, air yards, and unrealized air yards, deep targets, receptions, route wins, and receiving yards, right? So, he's still a top 25 wide receiver in all those stats. And at the end of the day, he is a very talented wide receiver on one of the best offenses in the league who really hasn't looked like they've fully figured it out on offense for what we know their potential is, unless their name is A.J. Brown. And they're coming off their bye. So they had, they've had they had a whole week to kind of regather, figure out what they're going to do rest of the season. And so, I mean, I just, I'm just i betting on the talent here. I'm betting on what we saw last year with Dallas Goddard missing, what we saw after the bye. And that DeMonte Smith's going to kind of bounce back to where I personally thought he was going to be this entire season. I mean, I think the, the the valuable point you bring up in that case is that Dallas Goddard is going to be missing time. Mm -hmm. And that is the biggest, biggest thing for Devonta Smith. That was my biggest thing for him coming into this year was that I just don't know if he's going to do it with Dallas Goddard. Yeah. They both kind of struggled to start the season. Then we saw Dallas Goddard turn it on and that came at the detriment of Devonta Smith. But you know, without Goddard and, and with those games coming up, I mean, he's bound, bound to get plenty of volume in those games. And, you know what, if he doesn't win you your league, he's going to bring you deep into the playoffs. And again, when you get to the playoffs, then it's, it's, it's matchups he can absolutely take advantage of. So, yeah, I, I'm interested to see how long Dallas Goddard hangs out with uh, that broken arm. But I think there's absolutely a case there for Devonta Smith mm -hmm. to explode and be that top 10 guy like we saw last year as we come down uh, at the end of the season stretch here. For sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang in that same division. Not a wide receiver. I don't. I don't think we often think about quarterbacks as league winners. But you know what? For how much the for how much of a baller this dude has been over the last four games, for where you drafted him, for what I think you can actually trade for him. Right. The crazy thing is, I don't even think you could trade for this player and get like I think you could underpay for this player right now, and managers would be happy to accept your trade. Yeah. Dak Prescott, my goodness. Dak Prescott might be a top five quarterback for the rest of the season behind the likes of Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, and Patrick Mahomes. Over the last four weeks, 
24.9 fantasy points, quarterback one, 29, quarterback three, 28.3, a quarterback two, and nearly 40, 38.8 this past week, the overall quarterback one. We have seen a shift in this Dallas Cowboys offense. Mike McCarthy said they wanted to run the football more this year, but you know what? Since week six, the Dallas Cowboys are fifth in pass rate over expectation. They have not been running the football. They've actually been throwing the football more. And that has shown CeeDee Lamb has been getting peppered with targets. Mm -hmm. Scott, his passing attempts have been up since week six. And this plays perfectly into Dak Prescott's fantasy value because he has the easiest strength of schedule of all quarterbacks the rest of the season. Washington, Seattle, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Miami, Detroit, Washington. All of those teams are top 15 in fantasy points per game allowed to quarterbacks over the last four weeks. And they're like, even the ones that, you know, aren't even the ones that are outside of the top 15, there is a lot of potential for shootouts in these games. Like you look at Buffalo, especially Miami, especially Mm -hmm. Detroit, Detroit. Yeah. (laughs) There is a lot of potential for shootouts and high scoring games where Dallas is going to need to throw the football to keep up with these teams. Yeah. Would you trade? Would you here? let, Let me ask you this. Would you be willing to trade the likes of a Joe Burrow for Dak Prescott plus? Yeah, I probably would at this point. I mean, I'm gonna, especially if you can get a guy that you could plug in, you know, if you're like short at running back, a wide receiver guy, you could plug in there. You know, I'm not saying that he's like a wide receiver running back too, but, you know, I mean, you get enough that you could plug and play a guy, then yeah, I would for sure do that. Justin Herbert for Dak Plus? Like, are you willing to do that? He's a little bit more difficult, I think. Yeah, I think, honestly, probably would as well, especially the way Dak's been playing. It's been out unreal so far so yeah i think i think that's something i would i honestly think other outside of josh allen jalen hurts and patrick mahomes i'd be okay with trading you know like cj stroud i'd be okay with trading oh yeah you know, to go get Dak prescott even lamar lamar's been somewhat disappointing with the way this defense has played you know i think that factors into lamar's as well i mean i think lamar obviously is going to have a higher ceiling moving forward but so is burrow and herbert but I think it's not that much farther from where Dak is that I'd be, you know, w- that worried about trading if I could get up another player I could plug in my starting lineup as well. I mean, uh, b- the bottom line is this: like Dak has just been absolutely balling the mm-hmm. last four weeks, and there's a legit chance he goes the rest of the season finishing as a top five quarterback in every week. Like yeah. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility with just how many juicy matchups he gets. And with how the Cowboys or the Cowboys Cowboys <laughs> and how the Dallas Cowboys offense uh, has been has been shifting over the last sure. you know, four weeks here. So I'm in love with Dak the rest of the season. I absolutely love him down the stretch. And like you said, even if I have like a CJ Stroud, like Justin Fields, would you go and try and like flip Justin Fields for Dak Prescott right now? Who's supposed to be coming back next week? I don't think I, you can get that trade right now. But let's say let's say this. Let's say Justin Fields does come back in week 11. Uh, and he puts up, you know, a 25 point game. Would you go out and look to to sell Justin Fields for Dak right away? I think so. I mean, obviously, we know the upside Justin Fields has, but man, I don't. You don't want to get in the playoffs and have Justin Fields put up an 11 point game. Where I don't think Dak at this right. point is going to be doing that with the way he's been playing and the matchups that he has. So yeah, I think I'd go trade Justin Fields, go get Dak. I just, I, I don't think enough people respect Dak Prescott. No, I think the Dak narratives could... going around, especially after last year. Yeah, I would yeah. agree. I just don't think people respect him enough. And I think there is a legitimate chance he does finish top five at the quarterback position rest of the season. Like you said, if he finishes ahead of Lamar too, I wouldn't even put that out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. I wouldn't even put it past Patrick Mahomes. I feel crazy saying that, but like the it's dude's true. schedule is too good. He hasn't finished lower than the quarterback three in the last four weeks. I think the potential is there for how this Dallas Cowboys offense is shifting this year. For sure. I'll let you bring it home here with your last league winner. Golly, I think a lot of people are excited to get this player back. And yeah. frankly, I, 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 yeah, at the same time, I think they also wouldn't mind trying to flip him for a pretty penny right mm-hmm. now if they're able to. He's just such a polarizing player. I'll let, I'll let you talk about him here. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's Devon A chain. And honestly, I'm not going to drop many stats on it because there's not much on him, right? <laughs> he only, he's only played <laughs> three games. Three game sample size. Right? Um, but in those three games, he had 37 carries, 450 yards, rushing yards, averaged 12 yards per carry, scored seven total touchdowns, has almost, a, I think insane. he has 100 fantasy points in the year and only three games. I mean, it's just absolutely 
ridiculous what this guy does. This Miami team as a whole has been great running the ball, averaging four yards before contact. I mean, before, before they're even getting touched, they're averaging four yards before contact. Um, and since week four, Raheem Mostert, starting running back, has only seen 13 plus carries or over 13 carries one time and was actually out carried by A chain in both week four and five. His receiving work, Mostert's receiving work has been minimal these last couple of games. Um, and when you look at where A chain was against the Giants, he played m- most of his snaps in the backfield, but then he also played in the slot. He played out wide and then he played that in line. I don't know if you've seen that Tyreek where Tyreek kind of squats down. Yep. He played, he played one, one snap there. So they're moving them all over, getting them on jet sweeps. And, but man, I mean, this, this kid's exciting. I mean, he is, he's unreal when the ball is in his hands, he makes everybody miss and he is faster than everyone on the field than maybe Tyree kills the only guy who can keep up with him, right? And he's on his own team, so he doesn't have to worry about him. He does have a brutal playoff schedule against the, I mean, the Jets have been not great against running backs, but then get Dallas and Baltimore. But honestly, who cares? Who cares with the way this team's been going, right? They, they lost, to, they didn't look good against Buffalo and he still put up a hundred yards, still at 20 fantasy points. So I think that's just something that's just going to keep up. It doesn't matter who they play. I want this guy in my starting lineup. And there are very few guys at this point who I would really want to flip him for just knowing the upside he has. That And that that's the thing that makes him the league winner is the upside is a top five fantasy running back, mm-hmm. which you just can't, you can't find those dudes on the streets. And I know this backfield could get messy with Jeff Wilson back. He'll get his touches, but you know what? When Devon Achan comes back and he puts up one of those exciting electric 40 yard touchdown runs, you know Mike McDaniel isn't going to be able to keep him off the football field. Mm-hmm. Like Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert just don't have that same juice in them anymore. Sure, mm-hmm. they can break off a big run and they, they, they can be fast, but there's just something about Devon Achan with the ball in his hands. Uh, like that, I, I think of the one the one over the uh, one middle of the field clip where Achan is just oh, weaving yeah. in between Denver Broncos players. And they're just, it's just like on the field laying down. Right. Like, yep. It's just like, like I get Denver's defense hasn't been great this year. But th- not every running back can leave a trail of receiver or a trail of defenders behind them like Devon Achan has. For sure. Slippery, shifty, everything of the shorts. One of the most explosive running backs in fantasy football. Definitely. I 100% agree. I think he has to be in this conversation. And the best part is that you can probably go get him at a slight discount. My, sorry, I have to get a word out on this now. I hate it when people say this player isn't a buy low because it's their first week coming back from injury. Where is his value currently? Yeah. His value isn't the same as it was when he was putting up 30 plus. And if he puts up people, 30 plus on it's way up. Right. And, and people, people right, it shoots back up immediately. Mm-hmm. People aren't even willing to entertain the same offers. Yep. And people, people will then say, well, no, the time to buy low was when they first got injured. Nobody is buying him low when he first gets injured. Mm-hmm. Nobody is even going to sell him low when he for the time. If you really want the optimal time is when you know, like, okay, all right, they're they're out for the next two weeks. But the problem is that again, when you're injured in this pivotal chunk of the season, mm-hmm. where it's between weeks, you know, four and nine, yep. those are the pivotal weeks where you need to solidify your spot in the playoffs. And not a lot of teams are be, are going to be willing to give up capital for a guy who they aren't going to get back until the final playoff push. They want to lock in their spot as soon as possible. Yeah. So people say that that you can't buy low on a guy who's coming back off of injury. I would very, very much disagree because I think buying low is not fleecing. Buying low is not getting Devon Achan for AJ Dillon. Mm -hmm. Buying low is getting Devon Achan for who's a guy you'd be willing to put in this conversation for Devon Achan. Joe Mix, I, I think that's actually a I think that's actually a sneaky good one. Uh you can capitalize on Joe Mixon's consistency. I'm going to pull up a few other names here that you might be able to throw out and get. Um, I mean, you look at, plus. yeah, I, Alexander Madison is a name I'd be willing to throw out here mm. with him being the lead back now in Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> Najee Harris with how good it, he's been playing recently. Uh, Aaron Jones. Do you be willing yeah. to do that? Yeah. I, well, yeah, I think I would at this point. I mean, Man, if you're shooting upside, especially if you're in a spot where you're like, I'm on the fringe. I don't know how great my team is. I mean, this could just jumpstart your whole team, right? This this would be like, this could potentially be like adding a Christian McCaffrey with how good he is. I'm not saying he's necessarily going to be that great, but that is what you're trading for at that point. 
Right. And so, yeah, I, I think those are all like feasible offers where uh, you make the manager think it's like, okay, mm-hmm. did Devon Achan just catch lightning in a bottle for three weeks and now he's going to suck rest of the season? Do I just take the guaranteed production out of, you know, a, a stud who's proven it before, like a Joe Mixon and Aaron Jones and you know, the other guys we mentioned? I mean, yeah, I, I, I think now is the perfect time. Buying low is swooping in with one of those guys and capitalizing on what Devon Achan could give you rest of season versus any of those guys. For sure. I'm going to talk about another guy, another rookie, actually, who's slow start to the season. It's been turning it on a little bit recently, though. I want to I want to talk about Jackson Smith and Jigba as a potential second half league winner. It's a long shot. I think it's actually a more of a mega sleeper second half league winner than anything else. But I think JSN has set up for great success over the last seven weeks here. Ever we since Seattle's week. Say that again. Stop quoting the dictator. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> great, great success. <laughs> great success. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite go through it. No, I, I just missed it. I was talking. I'm like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> That's my bad. No, that was good. That, that, I appreciate that reference. Uh, ever since Seattle's week five by though, uh, JSN snaps. They continue to go up. Seattle's been looking to get him more involved. I know he only totaled five targets this last week, but you know what? Three of them came on the very first drive of the game. They were looking to get this dude involved right away. I mean, you hear about it all the time where offenses come out with this game plan. They come out with a scripted game plan. You know what? Jackson Smith and Jigba must have been in that game plan to get him going because he got three targets and three receptions for 39 yards right away at the start of the game. And typically we see these rookie wide receivers take seven, eight, nine weeks to really get integrated, Mm. uh, especially with the depth that Seattle has. Again, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, he's playing behind. But now that you know we're we're ten weeks into the season, nine games in for Jackson Smith and Jigba, like I think the schedule that he has coming up could really bode well now that he's fully settled into this NFL game pace. Sixth easiest strength of schedule rest of season. I mean, you look at tough draws against the Rams in Dallas and Dallas in two of his next three. But I mean, the rest of the season, San Francisco twice, Philadelphia, Tennessee, Pittsburgh, Arizona. I mean, you love those matchups. And I know people are going to say, oh, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, they are a nuisance. I mean, did you see Tyler Lockett last week? Top 10 wide receiver on the week. But I think you can go out and acquire JSN for cheap right now. I mean, you could probably acquire him. Again, we're talking about you know Joe Burrow for Dak Plus. 100%. Like JSN in that deal. Yeah. Uh, and you get a valuable depth exactly. piece that slot in as a starter. And I know people can be like, oh, but I want someone more valuable. Well, the thing is, like, you're not going to get anyone more valuable than, than that if you're willing to do a two for one there i i think that's the, i mean that's the perfect one because like you've said too i mean he's put up eight i mean his floor is nine points right now so right. at worst you get a guy who you're getting nine points out of and you're losing two points but then like you said you have this upside that is there that if he breaks out yeah i mean you got a two two league winners on your hand right and and just based on the schedule based on being the best wide receiver in this draft class. I think people just want to look at the performance on the field and say, hi, you know what? Are we sure Mm -hmm. he was the best guy in this class? No, he was the best guy in this class. Yeah, He's just behind DK Metcalf, behind Tyler Lockett, with Geno Smith throwing him the football, who hasn't looked really all that great this season until this last week. Mm -hmm. The upside in the talent is there. It exists. We can't just ignore that. And I think there's a legit chance he does outscore from here on out. One One of DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett rest of season. For sure. now, I think it'd probably be more likely Tyler Lockett than DK Metcalf, but I mean, without DK Metcalf, has yeah, you never know. It's DK Metcalf, you never know. But like, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities that he outscores one of those two and he becomes a 14 point guy the rest of the season. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. Now, was that like a you know, I'm on raw kind of league winner? No, but mm-hmm. I, again, with the talent he possesses, I like, I'm also not going to put it past him. Yeah, I'm not banking on that 100. percent I don't. It, it's tough to find the guys like Amon Ra every single year. You know, when when you look at back to two years ago, it's really hard to find those guys. But considering he's the best talent in this class, considering the matchups coming up, considering it's finally you know the the eight ten game mark that he's finally getting settled in, I think there's a legit chance he shows out in the latter half of the season here at the very least, becomes a consistent option to consider in your fancy lineups every week. 
Yeah, and I think that's that's it. That's why you'd go trade for him because at worst he's a guy who's going to put up between eight and twelve, which is like half the wide receivers at this point, anyways that you're considering right. starting. Right. But then he has an upside that these rest of the guys can't. Yeah, I think you said that perfectly. I think JSN's. I think you should, even if you don't believe he's going to break out, I think he's a guy you should go get right now. Like if I have Michael Thomas, I'm looking to trade like Michael oh, Thomas. Yes. For you know, I mean that's the. T- caliber of player you're probably going to have to give up you know it's not like we're not saying go give up cd lamb for jsn right we're not no, saying gosh no even no. like deontay johnson at this point right it's these wide receiver threes wide receiver almost fours that you're giving up for jsn so yeah i, I would agree i i would go acquire jsn that's it that's all that's all eight league winners that we have for this episode anything you want to add before we close out here no, I think it's you just got to go acquire these guys. Just go throw it offers. You know, I mean, it might, you might be surprised. Oh, I can't get Dak a lot cheaper than that. You know, like don't low ball, but you know, give decent offers. And some of these guys, you'll be surprised what managers are selling on them. Uh, and, and again, name value carries more than we think sometimes in fantasy uh-huh. football. Sometimes it's really tough to look past the name of man. You know what, Justin Herbert. You know, man, you know what? That's tough. But mm-hmm. like, but but, but there, there, there's a chance. There's always a chance. And I'm not again. We're not saying go make a one for one swap with these guys because there is a difference in their value. There's a difference in the name value. Mm-hmm. Just why you can take advantage of some of these trades down the stretch. I 100% agree. I think it's worth throwing out offers on some of these guys. You don't go out and lowball them. You don't give out stupid offers. We don't believe in that here. You got to test the waters on these guys. Definitely got to test the waters because buying low is not fleecing. Those are two totally separate terms, two totally Mm -hmm. separate definitions. Buying low simply means getting a player at a lesser value than what it will be down the line. I think that could be the case for a lot of these guys here, and they have a great chance to go out and put up dominating performances in the latter half of the season. Definitely. Thanks again for tuning in. If you're not subscribed to the podcast already, again, make sure you do that and make sure you turn on those notifications because that way you'll be alerted when all of our new episodes drop as soon as they are dropped. Leave us a nice little review as well. We appreciate hearing from you all over there. I haven't even, you know what? I always talk about, I always talk about leave a review and it's great to hear from you all. I haven't checked the podcast reviews recently. Have you, have you checked them at all recently? I have not. No, I haven't either. I'm, I'm going to take a gander at that. Ah, the last one is, 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 is still, <laughs> Oh, I love this Justin Fields take. Oh, I love it. I'm not giving you a one because I appreciate the advice. Clearly, you have a bias against Fields. That was posted. That was posted. Actually, a year a year ago tomorrow, that was posted. Wow. Funny enough. Look, look we, we appreciate hearing from you all. So if you want to leave a review uh, over on whatever podcast network you listen to, uh, we would appreciate it. We enjoy hearing from you all and getting feedback on our work. Uh, and if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel already, you better do that as well. We love hearing from you over on YouTube as well. Uh, if you Make sure you like, share, subscribe, everything of the sorts. Turn on the notifications. Again, so many videos coming up for you all every single day. You know, we, we do some some personal digging on our personal accounts as well. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Lucas Wenzel on the screen here on YouTube at CamLawFFF for Cameron over on Twitter. I'll be nice and throw in ties, Tyler underscore Plath. I know he's not here, but I'll throw him a bone because I'm feeling nice today. <laughs> Normally cool. he'd be chopped liver here, but that's okay. <laughs> Gotta love it. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back later this week. We'll be breaking down some start sit matchups this week. I guess I can't promise that. We might change it up. Did we decide on that? I don't think we have. Come back Thursday. Thursday. You'll see what we talk about on Thursday. There you go. I'll leave you in suspense. We might have something to do for you on Thursday. Thanks for tuning in, though. Stay safe, stay healthy. We will see you all later this week. Deuces. Deuces.